Leia here from LeiaFirstSight.com. In this video, we'll discuss the what and how behind the alkene reaction mechanisms. In this video, I'll take you through the mechanism of the halohydrin formation. What is a halohydrin? Halohydrin comes from halo, which is halogen, and hydrin coming from hydro, or water, meaning H2O. When we look at the mechanism for halogenation, we started with a carbon-to-carbon -carbon double bond that attacked something like Br2 and gave me the anti-addition of two bromine atoms. We assumed but didn't specify that the solvent in the above reaction was inert. An inert solvent is something that is just there to dissolve the molecules but does not take part in the reaction. For halogenation, you would use a solvent that doesn't react, for example, CH2, Cl2, CCl4, or anything similar to this. However, if you carry out this reaction in a solvent such as H2O, instead of getting two bromine atoms added, you're going to get a bromine on one carbon and an alcohol on the second. If you swap the solvent for an alcohol, for example, methanol or CH3OH, your product will have a bromine on one carbon and an OCH3 on the second forming an ether. So let's see how this reaction happens. Again, we'll start with our symmetrical 2-butene and react it with Br2 in the presence of H2O. The reaction starts out the same way. A slight polarization of the bromine molecule allows the double bond to grab the bromine, bromine attacks back, and the bond between them collapses onto the second bromine atom. The intermediate will have the bromonium bridge, as we've seen in the previous video, with a positive charge on the bromine and a partial positive on both of the carbon atoms that held the double bond. The difference here is what happens to the bromide ion in solution. Given that bromine is negative and it is solvated or dissolved in a polar solution like water, the water which has partially positive hydrogens will surround bromine from every angle, essentially caging it and making it unable to proceed with the reaction. With the second bromide ion unavailable for attack, the next best thing, or the secondary nucleophile in solution, that happens to be water, will come in and attack instead. So one of the lone pairs of electrons on the oxygen will come and attack the same way that bromine would, breaking one of the bonds and collapsing the electrons onto the bromine atom. This gives me another intermediate for the reaction, where I have bromine attached to one of the carbons and an OH2, which is an oxygen with three bonds, one pair of electrons and a positive charge. This positive oxygen is called an oxonium, and in order to remove the positive charge, we'll bring yet another water molecule into the reaction. Now remember, when you're using water as your solvent, you're not limited to one or two. You have thousands and thousands of water molecules, so you have more than enough to use in the reaction. A common mistake here is to take the oxygen electrons and attack the other oxygen. This appears correct because oxygen wants to attack the positive oxygen. However, oxygen is still an electronegative atom. Even though it has a positive charge, an oxygen will never attack an oxygen in these reactions. The positive charge from the oxonium is passed on to both of the hydrogens, so instead the water molecule will grab one of the hydrogens and collapse the bond between hydrogen and oxygen onto the oxygen atom, giving it back its lone pair of electrons. This gives me my final product, which is a butane with bromine on one of the carbons and an OH on the second one, now with two lone pairs of electrons and no formal charge. I also have an H3O plus forming in solution, which can balance the Br minus, but again, these are not things you have to show because ultimately in the reaction, you're looking for how the halohydrin formed. When you're starting with an asymmetrical molecule, 
the placement of the atoms and the partial charges are even more important. We'll start this mechanism like we did the last one, where the pi electrons reach out and grab the partial positive chlorine, breaking the bond between the two chlorine atoms. My intermediate will have the chlorine attached to both of the carbons that held the double bond, with a positive charge on the chlorine and a partial positive on each of the two carbons that initially held the double bond. As we said in the last video, even though both of these carbons are partially positive, we still have a secondary carbon which can potentially hold more of the partial positive charge, given that it would ultimately make a more stable carbocation. The primary carbon, because it would potentially make a less stable carbocation, will have less of that positive charge. The second chloride ion, just like the bromine, is going to be surrounded by water and unavailable for reaction. This allows a different water molecule to come in and attack the secondary carbon given that it is more partially positive and break the bond collapsing the electrons onto the chlorine atom. My intermediate will now have a chlorine in the primary position and an OH2 plus in the secondary position. Another water molecule in solution will then come and grab one of the hydrogens off the oxonium atom and collapse the bond as a lone pair of electrons onto the oxygen. My final product now will have a chlorine in the primary position and an alcohol or an OH in the secondary position. And the reason the alcohol is on the secondary carbon is because the intermediate had a greater partial positive on the secondary carbon and therefore attracted the water acting as your nucleophile to attack at that position. I will be happy to answer any additional mechanism questions in my weekly review sessions, live, online, and from the comfort of your home. I also offer one-on-one -on -one private tutoring. Visit my website for more information. Layafirstside.com slash organic chemistry.